Hello, everyone. I am Devin Contour, and this is my brother, Matthew Contour, Hi. and uh, welcome to P3 Educates. Um, a little bit to get started. My name is Devin Contour. Like I said, I am a recent graduate of AMDA in LA with a BFA in musical theater, and I am just doing theater in the area, trying to get through this uh, crazy time we're in. And Matthew? Oh, yeah, I'm Matthew. Uh, I just graduated from the Orange County School of the Arts. And in about 12 days, I'm going to be going to Shenandoah University in Winchester, Virginia. And today we have the wonderful, incomparable casting director, composer, musical director, Carol Weiss with us. Hello. Hello. Hi, Carol. Hello, kids. So, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? <laughs> All right. Well, how are you doing, first of all? I mean, in this whole COVID-19 fiasco, how have you been? How has it forced you to change what you're doing? Yes, very, very much. I mean, as, as you know, I teach a class, a live class. And there's something about the way that that class is structured that I cannot figure out yet how to do online. So I'm afraid we're going to have to wait until online gets better or until all of this nonsense goes away. So whereas I'm teaching some people individually and then writing, uh, the class for the time being is on hold. And I dearly hope to bring it back again because I love doing it. So that's, you know, it is a class in what you know, musical theater. Two words, mm -hmm. music, theater. Put them together. That's the class. Like you tell us a little bit about the class, like how it's structured, what do you do during it? How long is it? Okay, so um, in the first class, one of the things I do is give you a list of songs, 12 types of song, and make sure that in your book, you can fit in. It doesn't mean you have to have 12 songs, but you have to have a song that fits in each of these slots. We start with that. Then we talk about the idea of combining acting and singing. And that's what the rest of the class is about. We do various exercises. Of course, the very first one is the song as a monologue. That's how you must begin. Say the words as if music had never been written. So that's our first exercise. Our second one is even harder. It's sing the song as if rhythm had never been written. So you get to sing the notes, but not the rhythm. And then the third thing is you do get to sing the song. And that is class number one. And there are exercises, if there's homework. Sometimes when I, because I mostly teach adults in this class. I, my youngest student, I believe was nine and my oldest was in her eighties. And <laughs> to, to the adults, I have to say, there is homework and you must do it. Um, things like one of my favorite ones is called the active partner. Imagine that the lines that you have in the song are the answers to questions, sort of like Jeopardy, right? You have to make up the questions. Like, uh, where are you going? Somewhere over the rainbow. Do you understand? What do you find there? Okay, so that, that's an exercise that we do. And I have about eight or nine different exercises. So you, that you're forced to really look at, what is this I'm singing? What is it about? And that's, that's my, the final class, the ninth class, is actually an audition. Lord knows if we'll ever do them real again. And that I could do virtually. I bring in the casting directors who are very current right now, and we audition for them. And I've always said, if oh, when I bring in an agent, too, because when I first started, you didn't have agents for theater. Now people do. Anyway, if you get an agent and you get a job, you don't have to take the class again. That's it. So that's what I try to do. But as I said, hopefully, if if we get a little advancement in the technology, right now there's no way to have a live pianist, and I don't know how to work with just recorded music. It doesn't yeah. like fulfill the, the, the product. Yeah, so. I'm teaching Zoom voice lessons right now, and the piano is very hard with the lag and. Every, how everything sets up, it's quite difficult to get going. What I've done with my private, the couple of private students I have is, I, I make a track and I email it to them and they play it on their end. 
could see. Oh, it's so yeah. hard to hear both, but at least there together. So mm -hmm. that, I can think of more about. I understand that we're doing that at AMDA too. So. Oh yeah, I have a lot of friends that are uh, doing the Zoom, doing the online classes right yeah. now. Great. Yes, Jeff Rizzo, who is my accompanist, works at AMDA. Oh, and that's I him. know Jeff Rizzo. <laughs> I'm working with him on a choir right now. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> so what else can I tell you? All right, so um, I know you've done a lot of casting directing as well. As a casting director, what is kind of your process when you're casting a show? Well, step number one is always to talk to the creators and see what, what exactly are they looking for? Do they want to mirror the original show that was done on Broadway, you know, 80 years ago? Or they're looking for a new twist? Um, I have also done some, you know, original shows where nobody was sure what they were looking for. And it was always interesting to see, you know, People come in and, oh, it could be you, it could be her, you know, who knows? Now, something else after that, then, you know, casting directors put out what's called a breakdown, a list of the characters. And that has to be worded carefully. You really have to tell people, this is what we're looking for. Uh, and then, to me, afterwards, starting to field questions from managers and, and uh, agents, um, when I was casting, because I had been the pianist for all these auditions for so long, I knew just about everyone in town. And an agent would call and try to bamboozle me into thinking his client was not at all. Well, I knew they weren't. One of my funniest moments was, I was doing a, I think it was Oklahoma, yes. Just a, a tour of Oklahoma. And we were looking for a Judd Fry. Now, I don't know if you know who Judd Fry is in Oklahoma. I'll, I'll get to that at the end. I had an agent call me and say, I've got the perfect Judd Fry. Just perfect. I just one question I have to ask. Is it a man or a woman? So <laughs> obviously, you know at all who Judd Fry is. And just for everybody's knowledge, Judge Fry is a man. He's quite coarse and vulgar. So anyway, that's, that's something we do have to watch out for. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll explain why, because when you're casting, it's all about the time. People, uh, every every moment costs, you know, and we've got a director, we've got people sitting there whose time is valuable. So we have to be, we have to do this in the most expeditious way possible. And that's why sometimes there are several rounds. There's, you know, one round with just a casting director, and then it goes higher. Mm -hmm. That's that story. Uh, what are a few tips that you could give as a casting director seeing all the mistakes that people have made? Thousands. <laughs> okay. You know, the big thing is people come in there trying to impress the man. And you really can't. You can come in and, 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 and be a performer and, enjoy, and love the performance. That's something different. But to come in, you know, I have to start with my high note now, you know, it won't work. You you must, one of the New York casting directors I worked with said at one point, you have to retain your humanity. And that's the truth. You have to be a person. Because they're gonna they, they will judge you. There's not there's no way around it. This is the time you're gonna be judged. It's a business meeting, it's all of that. Still, you have to be a human being, and hopefully you have the talent to just entertain you. One of the little tricks I like to teach people, and it's, you can't do it until you're very experienced, is I'm sure that you were taught in school, never look at the panel. It's verboten, do not look. And I will tell you, there are times when you can, very carefully, very specifically. And the biggest problem is, if you look at the panel, one of three things happens. Number one, they're looking down at their paper, they don't even see you. Uh, number two, they're looking at you, they look totally bored. Number three, they're looking at you and they love you. But all three of these will invoke a reaction in you. If they're looking down, your head goes, oh, I missed my chance. If they're hating you, they go, oh, yeah, I might as well leave. Or if they love you, you go, they love you. So you must pick a place to do this just before you're going to jump into an emotionally drawing point 
that that catches you so that you're not stuck with those feelings, that you're back in the feelings of your song. So it's a little trick and it takes a long time to figure out. It's fun. You know, I love to, that. I, to me, the whole thing is fun. My best, I mean, as a pianist, my best auditions were, were when I connected so well with the singer that at the end of the song, we looked at each other. We didn't even care about those people over there because we had a great time. So I, all I can say is just have a good time. So you mentioned also that you are an accompanist and a, a pianist. What is it like to accompany for Broadway and being in the room with so many Broadway creatives? Oh, I love it. Are you kidding? I, when I write my book, do I have stories to tell? <laughs> I don't want to, I, I won't name drop, but what I do have, I mean, I've seen amazing things and amazing people do stuff. All right, one of my favorite stories, and there will be no names, is a, 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 an actor came in and he did his uh, song, and the director went, no, give me more, I need more. So the actor came on, sat and thought, and he came back and did it again. <laughs> Director again, not, no, you've got to excite me. You've got to do more. You know? Number three, the actor comes back. He starts to sing, and he drops his pants. And he had no underwear on. <laughs> that, was, that was his story. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh -huh. well, I've seen several like that. One, one guy was doing the revival. It was the Fiddler revival. And he brought in these is there's the little right. He brought in a baby to sing with. And oh nobody looked at them. They looked at the baby. <laughs> so these are things you don't do. We had a girl, we were doing assassins. Somebody brought a gun. Somebody brought a gun in the room. Oh my god. Are you crazy? <laughs> don't be crazy. Here's another rule. Don't be crazy. <laughs> okay. And the, 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 basically, the important thing is to be so involved in your material that you're not worried about what they're thinking. You just have, you're feeling that moment yourself. So, and um, something else that I gotta say, and the first, the first thing is learn it. Really, really, really know it. You know, I, I don't perform a lot, but a couple of years ago, I was asked to perform at 54 Below, which is a very fancy wow. place in New York because you want me to sing. Well, you know, I've written 5,000 children's songs, so I said, all right, okay, I'll force myself. Well, this is my song that I wrote. I must have sung it 18,000 times before I went on that stage, just because I knew this was my first time performing since I'm five. <laughs> so, and it worked. I was to totally secure, and that, that, we, that security helps. So keep saying that. <laughs> right. So coming for all these Broadway shows, and I know that you write yes. a lot of musicals. How is accompanying for Broadway and seeing all that influence the way that you write? Interesting. I um we the, the hardest part of writing, as far as I'm concerned, is structure. It's mm -hmm. keeping it flowing smoothly and make and keeping it, of course, interesting. Now, the things that I've written that I've gotten paid for are children's musicals. I've written a dozen of them, and they're published, and they're done. But to me, you can't just, like, I have my own version of Snow White. It's one of my big hits. And I think it's popular because it is the story of Snow White. The music is lovely, but it has some modernization in it. Uh, Snow, as you know, is in the palace with the the evil aunt, but, and, and she's cleaning. That's what her job is, to be the scullery maid in the palace. Then she runs away and she finds these dwarfs and it's wonderful. And what do they say to her? Why don't you clean up the cottage? And my Snow White goes, wait a minute, I'm a princess. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a twist there. And my magic mirror, actually my magic mirror travels on roller skates so he can move around. But he, he sings something important which is the true moral of uh, my show which is you are the mirror of everything you do you're the mirror of all. and and so again adding a, a moral into a story that didn't exist before i find for children it's important my version of pinocchio which has been done a lot pinocchio never got to school he never learned to read so 
So his father, Geppetto, leaves him a message. They don't trust the fox and the cat. He can't read the message. So he has to go into the audience looking for someone who can read the message. So those kinds of things. That's so fun. So when you write your, the child, a lot of your children's musicals are based off of source material. Yes. Um, so what is it like um, taking that source material? What's kind of your process in how to get it not exactly like that, uh, like the original source material and then creating new works? How does that kind of, what is that process kind of? Well, you know, the, the nice thing about doing those old fairy tales is they're what they call public domain. I can do anything I want to. Of course, <laughs> some theaters do. That Snow White that I wrote, I went to a theater out in Claremont because they were doing my show. They had eight dwarves. I went, wait, wait a minute. Well, somebody's <laughs> cousin had given a big donation to the theater. So <laughs> they had to add a dwarf, which, which I love. But uh, yeah. I, I, I do, I look at the material and I go, what can I do to keep a modern child interested in it? And so we try to do kind of things. Uh, my Alice in Wonderland, which premiered at the Long Beach City Black Opera, do you remember that there was a turtle in that story? I don't know if you remember. Anyway, mine was a teenage ninja turtle. <laughs> I, I thought after a few years, I'd have to rewrite that, but they're, they're still around. So it's yeah. been for, for a long time. So again, these are just, they're little tricks, little gimmicks, but the, 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 the truth of it is, I mean, the story of Alice, Alice, my Alice is doing a math problem. And she goes, eh, if I don't want this. I don't want logic. I want silliness. I want the world to be totally illogical and silly. And she learns finally that, of course, you can't have a world like that because the world, you won't be very happy with it. So again, yeah, that's the moral, that's the story, but there is a mutant ninja turtle. So. I also just have to tell you, so about Buddy's Big Day Out, um, which is one of your musicals. Yeah, yeah. Um, the boy who played Buddy, Ari yeah. Paulton, is one of my best friends. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I remember when he was in it and he was talking about it and then we were looking you up and we saw it and I was like, oh my God, this is Buddy's big day out. <laughs> it was he great. He left for college the other day, but I just had to tell you. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm glad you saw it. I, I had the best time writing that, you know, writing dog parts for people. I have two dogs, so I'm, I'm a dog person. Um, I'll tell you a, maybe a, a little off color story. The, there were people who were sort of sponsoring this and they were people who wanted to spay and neuter animals, which is, you know, in the shelters, that's a good thing. So they asked me to write a song about spaying and neutering. And I went, this is a children's show. <laughs> anyway, I wrote my first rap song. It's called Multiply. And I don't know if you remember from the show, but they were just multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. You've got to stop the multiplying. <laughs> and that was, that well, was yeah. how we did. <laughs> So, but it was good for me to, to do rap. It's not, that's something about my shows. My songs have melodies, except for the rap song. I, I want to, if I have a goal in my children's musicals, it is to keep alive the notion of a melody, that songs have melodies. Because people forget that. So, that's what I want to do, is preserve melodies for another generation or two. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, well, I know that you've worked on TV as well. Yes. Um, what are the differences working on working with Broadway and the musicals, and then working with TV? Well, TV's faster. You got to get it done right away, and, and then, you know, Broadway at least you got a little time after you cast. You have some time to rehearse. TV, uh, uh, learn it, go do it. It's on. We're taping tomorrow. That's the way. <laughs> and I think even though Broadway still looks at names, you know, TV more so, you know, and the talent sometimes becomes secondary. Um, I worked on a, a soap opera called Days of Our Lives. And what they did was, uh, I, I'm sorry, no, this is General Hospital. General Hospital, yeah. Okay, on GH, once a year they would have a, 
um, a nurse's ball. It was a, an AIDS benefit. And the idea was the, the regulars would have to sing. Now, some of them could sing. One of them had actually been a, a walking up on his arm. Most of them, not so much. We got we hired professional backup singers to to, to use to help them, and we picked the simplest songs. And I, my job was to put them in a key where the singer could sing it. Once and only once did I pull the awful trick that they do in the film. I think it's Singing in the Rain, where although the actress was singing. I had somebody <laughs> behind there going into the mic. And no, she didn't oh even know. God, she she did. thought it was her. So oh my God. <laughs> I just couldn't. I couldn't let it go out that way. So uh, we pulled off that track. <laughs> it was <so> fun. Great. <laughs> what were <laughs> um, <laughs> what were some of your like what did you do a lot on General Hospital? And like, oh, what were some of your duties on General Hospital? You know, the basic thing that I did was one month out of the year, I'd come in, they'd give me an office, and I'd create this thing, which was their nurse's ball. And I would hire the musicians and pick songs that were easy to sing. And then worked with a wonderful director, choreographer, Peggy Hickey, who was still working in Broadway shows and everything. And we would train these TV actors to be musical theater, and they actually liked it. They, it was sort of a respite once a year for them to come in and do that. And I put together a band and we'd play, and uh, that was it. It was the musical month of General Hospital. So it was great fun. I worked on a TV game show for a couple of years. I don't know. Really? Yeah, it was called Face the Music. And the idea was the band would play songs and they would be clues to the identity of a famous person or a thing or a saying. There was a girl singer. And I had to be careful because I had to choose songs that people would recognize so they could get them. And when they didn't recognize them, the producers folded me. So I had to be very careful. But it was fun. It was an interesting, interesting time. I always made sure that the title of the song was where the girl was singing. She would sing the title so people could figure it out. I see there's a question in the chat. Yes. Um, you said, for people who have sent in virtual audition songs and monologues who have clearly not memorized their audition pieces, what words of wisdom can you offer to them? Oh, when they have to send in the virtual things? Yeah. It's, it's a tricky business. The, the big problem I see is you want to sing to a partner. So if you could have someone in the room with you, besides the person even taping, that you can sing to, you'll be so much more alive. And that's what I can say. I also make sure you know the material and make sure that you express, think about what you're singing. People forget, they get nervous. You can't, you know, if you're nervous, it means you don't know the stuff well enough. Go back, learn it some more, and then again, it's the material, it's what you're saying. And you have to create that story in your head. Why, I'm on a, I don't know why I'm on Over the Rainbow Day, but why is Dorothy saying that? What happened to her that made her say that? I think in a regular acting class, you learn something called before and after. And it's the same when you're singing a song. What just happened that made you sing this? And when you finish, what, where are you now? What's going to happen? You have to maintain all of that and not worry about taping. That's all. You're going to look like what you're going to look like. You know? <laughs> what can I say? So be real. Great. Um, so. Um. Okay. So that's all of our questions. Okay. Um, um, so thank you so much for being here. Like, this has been really amazing getting all that insight from you. Um, and for those of you who are watching, uh, if you would like to donate to P3 Educates, you can go to their website at p3theater.biz and make a donation there. Or you can go to their Facebook page or Instagram page and there's gonna be a link there to go make a donation. And um, for Carol, you can see her. Uh, where can they find out about your theater house when it comes up? 
a website, carolweissmusic.com. And that's the best way you can learn about my workshop and about my plays. I've got bits of songs and videotapes on there too. So Yeah, definitely check it out. Thank She's you. really great. Thanks so much for um, doing that. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. And everyone else, have a great day. Thank and you. And bye. Be well. Everybody, thank you. <laughs>